ओम ज्ञानतिरांधस्य ज्ञानाजनशलाकय चक्षुचैतन्यमनोभीष्ट स्थापित भूतले स्वयं कदा मह्यम ददाति स्वदाक वंदेहम श्रीगुर श्रीयुतपदकमल श्रीगुरून वैष्णवांश्च श्रीरूप साग्रजात सह गणरघुनाथन्वित तम सजीव साइत सवधूत पिजन सहित कृष्णचैतन्यदेव श्रीराधाकृष्णपाद सह गणलिता श्री विशाखान्विता नम ओं विष्णुपादा कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी ना नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिणे वाछाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैतगदाधर श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण सो दस फार वी हैव टॉक्ट अबाउट ग्रेट डिवोटीज हु आर आई द सन्यासीज और ब्राह्मणस एंड दे वर क्वाइट poor so we need some variety because in the community of great devotees of the lord there are devotees of all sorts from all social backgrounds from all types of economic backgrounds performing different types of works in this world so let's talk about some great devotees who were kings they were royal people living in the midst of opulence performing valorous acts on the battlefield administering the kingdom and so on and still in spite of that they were very high class devotees of the lord because we want to know how devotional service can be performed in different situations in life by different categories of people it isn't that devotional service can be performed only by sanyasis or only by poor people devotional service is meant for everyone and the history of the world shows that great devotees have appeared in all kinds of backgrounds so let's talk about one a couple of great devotee kings we'll start with the great devotee king prataparudra how many of you have not heard of king prataparudra raise your hand so many okay so prataparudra was the king of orissa the state of orissa in india at the time when chaitanya mahaprabhu was living there as you know after chaitanya mahaprabhu took sanyas at the request of his mother instead of going to vrindavan he went to jagannath puri and he stayed there so the king was already a great vaishnav at that time he was a great devotee of lord jagannath but he didn't have much knowledge about who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was The kings of Orissa have a long history of great devotion to Lord Jagannath and many of the services of Lord Jagannath are very intimately connected with the kings the kings have a very vital role to play in the history of Lord Jagannath and in any case it's because of king indra dyumna that jagannath manifested in, in any way in the first place king pratap rudra only after mahaprabhu is coming to jagannath puri could understand his glories and he also became 
he is very loyal follower. Now, even though he was a very brave, courageous king, very wealthy, and the sphere of his influence extended for great distances from Puri, but nevertheless, he always remained a very humble, devoted soul. He had a guru. What was the name of the guru of King Pratap Rudra for those of you who have heard the name? Um, he was the court minister of sorts, school guru, okay, but specifically who was the minister, uh, the guru? At whose house did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stay when he was there? Kashi Mishra. So Kashi Mishra was his guru and he would go to, every day he would go to the house of Kashi Mishra and he would massage the feet of Kashi Mishra and he would discuss many affairs of the state and he would also hear from Kashi Mishra about how the service of Jagannath was going on and what happened on that day. Jagannath is a very dynamic lord, so there's always something or the other happening. <laughs> some interesting pastime that goes on with some devotees, something happens. So King Pratap Rudra used to keep himself updated. And once he became a follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was desperate to get darshan with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Mahaprabhu was always declining. And he was saying, well, I'm a king, I'm a sannyasi. I should have nothing to do with these, these people who are worldly-minded. And in Prabhupada's words, pound shilling spends people. Meaning that people who are involved in all kinds of materialistic activities, in sense enjoyment, like kings and so on, I don't want to be with them, I'm a sannyasi, I can't mix around with these people. Because generally kings, are known to live the high life and they like to have a lot of sense enjoyment. Then the devotees try to explain to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that this king is not like that. He is actually a very devoted soul. He is a pure devotee of Jagannath. And he also is very surrendered to your lotus feet. And he just wants your darshan one time. And Mahaprabhu would get annoyed. And finally he told the devotees, if you pressurize me like this anymore, I will leave Jagannath Puri and go away from here. Then all the devotees became terrified and they didn't want to raise the topic again. Because who would want to risk Mahaprabhu leaving Puri and going away? When the king heard that Mahaprabhu was unwilling to meet him, he was extremely distraught with grief. And he says, has Mahaprabhu come into this world to deliver all sorts of people except one fallen soul called Prataparudra? Has he taken a vow that he should deliver everyone except me? What is the use of my life if I don't get the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? So better I should renounce the kingdom and become a wandering mendicant. So everyone was struck with wonder to see his determination and to see the faith that he had in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and also his sense of renunciation and detachment. It's not easy for a king to say, I'll just give up my kingdom. Of course, in the Vedic days, people were trained like that. From a very young age, as princes, they were sent out into the, into the forest to uh, cultivate detachment so that by the time came when they took over the kingdom and when they became older in age they would be able to give up the kingdom easily. Nowadays people don't want to give up their posts. Prabhupada used to say unless they are shot dead they will not leave their chairs. They don't want to leave the post. They will keep contesting elections even till they are 90 years old. But the kings in the Vedic culture were not like that. They were trained in detachment. And there was succession planning also. So they would plan their next successors. So King Pratap Rudra finally was granted the mercy of the Lord 
because of the mercy of the devotees, as we have discussed earlier today, because Nityananda Prabhu, Sarvabhauma Bhattacharya, Ramananda Rai, <coughs> and many, many other devotees who knew the glories of Prataparudra were every now and then trying to petition Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to shower mercy on the king. Finally, one day, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu relented. <coughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu internally knew the glories of Prataparudra, but he just wanted to set an example that sannyasis should not mingle <coughs> with people who are involved in all sorts of sense enjoyment. Even though Prataparudra was not like that, but because generally kings are like that, Mahaprabhu wanted to send out a message to the world. And then one day at Rathiyatra time, when <clears throat> Mahaprabhu was tired from the dancing, and Lord Jagannath had stopped at a certain place en route. <clears throat> he went into the nearby garden and lay down for a few minutes to take rest. And the devotees found the opportunity and told Prataprudra, Okay, this is your chance. Now you go. But you change into the dress of an ordinary devotee. Don't go like a king. So King Prataprudra changed came in disguise as an ordinary devotee and Mahaprabhu was lying there and King Prataprudra began to gently massage Mahaprabhu's lotus feet and then he began to chant many verses glorifying Krishna and his pastimes. And specifically, he began to chant what is called the Gopi Geet from the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam beginning with Jayati Tedhikam. <clears throat> it's very famous in Vrindavan. Especially in the month of Kartik, devotees in Vrindavan like to sing this song, Gopi Geet. And that was sung by the gopis in the autumn season when Krishna disappeared from their midst and they were searching here and there for Krishna. So Mahaprabhu is also relishing the mood of separation from Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani. So he was hearing these songs, <clears throat> these verses being recited very sweetly by uh, King Prataparudra, which goes to show that in those days even the kings knew these things. There was so much culture. The kings were also so well devotionally educated that they knew all these things. So he was reciting these verses. <clears throat> and finally, <coughs> when King Prataprudra came up to a verse. We don't have the time to discuss this whole pastime in detail because we're just giving examples today. And he chanted a verse that began with Tavakatham Ritam. It's a very famous verse. And one can discuss this verse for a long time. It's very dear to the Vaishnavas. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as soon as he heard that verse, he suddenly became very excited. Because in this verse, it says, the gopis are praying to Krishna, Tava Kathamritam Tapta Jeevanam, that my dear Lord, my dear Krishna, the nectar of talks about you can actually douse the fire of material existence that is blazing in the hearts of the living entities here. Because everybody in this material world is suffering. And this suffering condition can be mitigated immediately when we hear Krishna Katha. So only one type of person should not hear Krishna Katha, or rather, I should not say should not hear Krishna Katha. Only one type of person need not hear Krishna Katha, and that is the person who is not unhappy. But who can say he's not unhappy? Everybody is miserable in this world. And actually, even those who are truly happy, that means those who are Krishna conscious, they want to hear Krishna Katha more and more and more. That is the nature of Krishna Katha. Tava Kathamritam Tapta Jeevanam Kaviviriditam Kalmashapaham The great devotees have also been speaking about this, broadcasting this. And Krishna Katha uh, destroys all the 
uh, unwanted things in the heart. All the material desires in the heart are destroyed. Shravana Mangalam, Shri Madatatam. These very beautiful songs which are broadcast all over the world are full of auspiciousness. And then he says a very interesting thing. He uses the word Bhuri Dajana. He says, therefore, those who are very magnanimous souls, they uh, broadcast this all over the world. So those who broadcast Krishna Katha, those who speak Krishna Katha are very magnanimous, big-hearted souls. Bhuri Dajana. Bhuri means very big-hearted. Bhuri Jana. Bhuri. Bhuri Da. So when Mahaprabhu heard this Bhuri Dajana, then immediately he came out of his uh, rest and he said, Bhuri Da, Bhuri Da. And he embraced King Prataparudra. Because he was still in a state of trance, externally he didn't appear to recognize who, who this king was. Otherwise he would have never embraced him. But he embraced him and said, Who are you? Who are you? You have come to give me so much nectar. I am so grateful to you. I have nothing else to give you except my embrace. So he embraced King Prataparudra who was simply swooning in devotional ecstasy. Of course, Mahaprabhu knew that this was King Prataparudra. And then he revealed his opulences to King Prataparudra and forbade him from ever disclosing all this to anybody. So this was a special mercy that King Prataparudra received from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And why was this so? Because of his great devotion because of his complete faith, he got so much mercy. Therefore, King Prataparudra was not just a great king, a just ruler, a powerful warrior on the battlefield, a very good administrator who was much loved by his subjects and so on. He was also, most importantly, a great pure devotee of the Lord a real hero in every sense, materially as well as spiritually. Actually, he, the tradition, his father was also like that, a great devotee. And his father was also a very staunch devotee of Jagannath. One time it so happened that some a marriage proposal came for his father, Prataparudra's father, when Prataparudra's father was a young man. He was called Purushottam Dev. And the proposal was for marriage from the king of Kanchi in South India. His daughter's name was Padmavati. So the proposal for Padmavati's marriage with Purushottam Dev came across. And the king of Kanchi wanted to find out who is his prospective son-in-law. So there are different stories. In one story it says he sent his minister in another story, it says that he came himself to Puri. Either way, when he came, it happened to be the time of Rathyatra. And you know that in front of the Rath of Lord Jagannath, the king of Puri comes and sweeps the floor. So when the king of Kanchi or his minister came, and they saw, what is this? I married my... I'm going to marry my daughter to someone who's a sweeper? He cancelled the marriage. He said, no, I can't. So he went back and King Purushottam Dev was infuriated. It was not a pricked ego for him. He didn't mind the insult to himself, but he considered this as an insult to Lord Jagannath. He said, I'm not sweeping the ordinary of some floor, I'm sweeping for Jagannath. Because the king of Kanchi was not a follower of Jagannath and he didn't appreciate Jagannath. He was a worshipper of Ganesh. So he thought Ganesh is supreme and who is his Jagannath? So then because of his offense, King Purushottam Dev became enraged. And then he set out in battle. He took his army all the way from Puri to South India. 
and he waged war against the king of Kanchi. But somehow or the other, he could not emerge victorious. So he came back to Jagannath Puri and then he went in front of Jagannath. I am your devotee and I went to uphold your prestige and just see you didn't let me win the battle. And then Jagannath told him, but did you even ask me once before you left? <laughs> you just went like that. You didn't bother coming to me, take, you know, asking me, should I go, should I fight? You went on your own. And then Pr Purushottam Dev realized his mistake. He said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Next time, now please give me your blessings. Jagannath Dev said, okay, don't worry. And then, again after preparing his, his forces, he set out after a while again. Meanwhile, he reached a certain point, midway, where he met one old lady who came and stopped his army. The king was on the horseback right in the front. So she came and stopped the king. She said, wait. So the king said, what happened? She said, two of your soldiers came here. Two of my soldiers? I am the first one leading here. No soldier of mine has come ahead of this. No, no, they came here and I sell buttermilk and yogurt and milk and so on. And they drank everything I had. And then after they did that, they said that we don't have any money. But you can collect it from the king who is following us behind. So we have want to collect the money from you. So he said, I don't know about any soldiers who have come to buy milk from you. Do you have any proof? So she said, yes. I told them to give me some proof by which the king will uh, at least agree that two of his soldiers had come. So they gave me a ring. Okay, so show me the ring. So then when the king saw the ring, he realized this was the deity, this was Jagannath's ring. Then he realized that Jagannath and Balabhadra themselves had gone on the horse before as an advance party. <laughs> and then they dealt with the king of Kanchi and by the time King Purushottam Dev reached, he was also waging battle. And then he emerged victorious in that battle. So there are many stories like this of great kings who were great devotees and they depended completely on the Lord and the Lord assisted them in every way. Anyway, so Purushottam uh, Dev, he defeated the king, but he would not marry Padmavati. <coughs> that is how the story goes. So he came back. He said, because he is, anyway, I have taught the king a lesson, but still, uh, wh when the daughter was sent there for marriage and, and Purushottam Dev's minister brought her he said, please marry her. She said, no, marry her to a sweeper because she's not supposed to marry me. So the minister was very intelligent. So he waited. Waited till when? Yes. The next Rathiyatra, <laughs> which is anyway very shortly coming. So when the king was sweeping the floor, the road, he brought Padmavati in front and said, okay, so what are you doing? What do you mean? He said, yes, I'm marrying her off to a sweeper. <laughs> And that is how the marriage took place. So these are the stories of some great king devotees who had so much staunch faith in Jagannath, in Krishna, in Lord Ram and so on. And that's how they ruled their subjects. And they also ensured that their subjects would be devotees of the Lord. So whatever battles they waged were not out of ego. They were only for the service of the Lord for the establishment of dharma. Similarly, there was another great king who lived in South India, in the province of Kerala, and his name was Kulashekhar. He was one of the twelve Alvars, who are famous in the Sri Sampradaya. The word Alvar indicates one who is intoxicated with love of Godhead. So King Kulushekhar at some point in time, by the grace of the Lord, became so transformed that he was constantly absorbed in devotional trance. 
he would always be thinking about Krishna. And he would go into these trances and pine and hanker for going to holy places to have darshan. Sometimes he would, he would lament and say, Oh, how unfortunate I am that I am here in this worldly-minded profession as a king. I have to live in the midst of so much of this opulence. Whereas I would simply like to be serving the Supreme Lord, I would like to go and be with Lord Ranganath in Sri Rangam. Sometimes he would say, Oh, I would like to go and be with Lord Balaji in Tirumala. And different holy places, one after the other, every day he would come up with some other holy place. Oh, I wish I was there. I wish I was there. And he began to lose complete interest in the running of the kingdom. So much so that the ministers started to get worried. And he was a great devotee of Lord Ram. So till the time of his devotional transformation, even materially he was an excellent administrator, an excellent king, a very brave warrior. And he was very loved by his subjects. So one day, when his Ramayana reading was going on, he would have one of the devotees coming and reading to him, and they would discuss the scriptures. So the passage in the Ramayana that was going on was about in, in Dandakaranya, when Lord Ram was single-handedly fighting with 14,000 Asuras. This was after the Shurpanakha episode. Shurpanakha, when she was, her nose and uh, ears were cut, her face was disfigured by Lakshman. Then Shurpanakha went running to her two brothers, Kara and Dushan, who were living nearby. And they were enraged. So they sent a few generals first. Ram easily killed them. Then they send their whole army of 14,000 Rakshasas. So when Ram saw them coming, he told Lakshman, you guard Sita. Don't leave her at any point in time. And I'll deal with these Asuras, these Rakshasas. So then single-handedly he stood there. And he started fighting with them. So at that time, in the Valmiki Ramayana, there's a description which says, how can the hero fight alone? Because Ram was all alone. And when uh, King Kulushekar heard that, he went into an agitated frenzy. My Lord Ram is alone, fighting with 14,000. Rakshas says, I must go and help him. So immediately he rose and roared like a lion and called his army. He said, come on, valiant soldiers, let us go to the assistance of Lord Ram. He needs our help. Although Lord Ram's episode happened in Treta Yuga, <laughs> but now he's living the episode. He said, come on. And then all the generals were puzzled, looking at each other. We have to go to protect Lord Ram. What is our king talking about? And then all the kings, all the soldiers, generals, all got together and a huge army set out. At a furious pace, they were going. Meanwhile, the ministers were thinking, what's happened to our king? We don't know what to do. Has he gone mad or what is this? And then they said, somehow or the other, we have to save the situation. So what did they do? They sent an advance party of soldiers. They said, don't tell the king anything. You just go way ahead and then turn around and come towards the king and meet him from the opposite direction and tell him that Lord Ram has killed the Rakshasas. <laughs> so these soldiers, they went way ahead and then wheeled around and came backwards. And they came back and as King Kulushekar was furiously going with his soldiers, raising war cries, and then these soldiers met King Kulushekar. How come you are here? So they replied, we have just come from the place where Lord Ram has slaughtered all these Rakshasas. So he has killed them. Yes, he has emerged victorious. And none of those Rakshasas remain. So King Kulushekar was satisfied. Okay, so now uh, no need for us to go. No need for it. <laughs> so then he went back. So after that incident, the old 
Brahmana who was to come and recite the Ramayana before the king became very cautious. He, he would only read those sections of the Ramayana that would not agitate the king. <laughs> only happy pastimes he would read. At any trouble similar, he would intelligently just skip or he, he would go to some other pastimes. One time it so happened that uh, the old Brahmana had to go out of the town for some work. So he deputed his son to go and read. And the son did not know all this <laughs> about the king's mood and all that. So he began to read as normal and then he came to the time when uh, you know Ram is stationed on the uh, shore of the sea about to go to kill Lanka, uh, to kill Ravana in Lanka and the bridge is being built and Sita is there in Lanka and again he got enraged. He said, I must go there, I must go and kill that evil Ravana. So again he got his army together, all the generals, come on, let's go. And he, this time he was in such a fierce mood that even the ministers, the generals dared not come in front of him. And then he went to the seashore and he entered into the sea. And he was walking into the sea and his soldiers, he was saying, yes, soldiers, come on after him. And they were thinking what to do. And then he started walking with his sword upraised. Uh, and then he, he went into the sea and he was almost up to his neck in the water. Meanwhile, the ministers were just wondering, there's nothing they could do except stand and stare. Because nobody could dare go near the king now when he was in these episodes. At that time, the deity of Ram in the palace of King Kulashekha decided that he had to do something about it. He said, I think things have become a little critical right now, <laughs> requires my intervention. So then Lord Ram suddenly appeared in front of Kulushekar along with Sita from the opposite direction, from the direction of Lanka. And he was walking on the water and he came to Kulushekar and said, Oh my dear devotee, don't worry, just see I have Sita with me. I have rescued her from that evil Ravana. Ravana is killed, his soldiers are killed and now I will take you back. So then he escorted him, just as I escort the conditioned souls across the ocean of birth and death, I will also take you across the sea and place you back at the outskirts of the city. And then he personally lifted King Kulushekar and brought him to the city. Now after this episode, the ministers were really in a quandary, what to do, what to do. And each time, every day the king would say, today I want to go to Sri Rangam. Tomorrow he said, no, no, I want to go to this holy place. Every day he wanted to leave. So then the uh, ministers decided, okay, let's do one thing. Let us call a group of Vaishnavas every day. Because when he sees Vaishnavas, he likes it. And he begins to serve them. So when he's serving them, he won't leave. He'll be there. So then they started calling one group and then the king was overjoyed. He began to serve them all day. He would personally serve them. The next day another group and another group. And gradually what happened is, the whole city was flooded with Sri Vaishnavas then. <laughs> and the king didn't observe any formalities with them. So they could come into his palace and go out and everything. They were free to do anything and everything. And the, the minister started wondering, now we are getting besieged by these Vaishnavas and they are all over, they are just walking here and there and our king is just spending all the time serving them and who is going to look after the kingdom? So then they hatched a plot. So they deliberately hid uh, a diamond necklace of the deity of Lord Ram. And then when they reported the matter to the king, the king said, who has stolen it? They said, one of the Vaishnavas, she has stolen it. So the king said, impossible. Such a thing cannot even enter into the minds of my pure devotees. So he said, you are lying. So then he said, all right, let us do a test. Now let a poisonous cobra be bought, brought in a basket. So somehow the other, that was arranged. And then he said, okay, 
Now I will put my hand inside this basket. If the Sri Vaishnava is indeed guilty, then let this cobra bite me. And if he is not guilty, then the cobra will not bite me. So then all the ministers were petrified now. So the king put his hand inside and brought it out unharmed. And then he proved that the Sri Vaishnavas were not guilty. Then the king, the ministers confessed and they begged forgiveness. <coughs> and just as the king forgave others, he forgave the ministers also. But by now he had become disgusted. He says, enough of not just his ministers, I'm disgusted of this material world. I just want to go and serve the Lord. So then he took his daughter and he went to Sri Rangam and he lived there. And he served and he wrote many, many poems and songs. Especially he is famous for, for which composition? Mukund Mala Stotra. Prabhupada used to chant one particular verse from this Mukund Mala Stotra. Does anyone know that? Yes. Hmm. Say in the mic. Have a mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Krishna Tadiya Padapanka Japancha Rantam Addaivahi Vishatu Manaso Raja Hamsa Prana Prayana Samaye Kaffa Vata Pitta uh, Kanthava Rodha Smaranam Kutasthe Smaranam? Ah. Kanthava Rodhana Smaranam Kutasthe Kutasthe So what is the meaning of that? Uh, my dear Lord Shri Krishna uh, Krishna Tadiya Padapanka Japancha Rantam May the swan of my mind hmm. be entangled in the stems of the lotus feet of hmm. your lordships, hmm. immediately may you uh, uh, immediately may you grant me the wish of death, because right now I have a strong body and my mind is fixed on you. I can remember you, and in this way, if I die, hmm. I will reach you. Hmm. What is the guarantee that in old age, when my throat is all choked up with mucus and cough, then how is it? How would it be possible for me? to remember you at that time in that broken state of body. Excellent. Very nice. You get one pras Mahaprasadam item. <laughs> so one Mahaprasadam. Yes? Mahaprasadam later in the temple. Give. Krishna Tvadiya Padapankaja Panjarantam Adhyaiva Me Vishatumana Saraja Hamsaha Prana Prayana Samaye Kafabata Pittai Smaranam Kutaste. Prabhupada used to sing this verse over and over and over again in the form of a song. So King Mukunda or, or, or uh, King Kulashekhar actually sang this, he composed this. And then he became one of, he, he became known as one of the very famous Alvars. So there are many things to learn, as I said earlier also, that we are not to imitate. It doesn't mean that if you are kings and that a devotee, a king is a devotee, then he should also be like that. Take his army and go. Hmm? Then in the modern day world such a thing will not happen. You cannot run your kingdom if you are like that. But King Kulushekhar was an extreme case because he was such an exalted devotee. He was always in trance. He was in ecstatic love for Krishna. But there are many lessons to learn from these stories of great kings, even though we can't imitate them. Uh, just goes to show that we can learn from great devotees in all situations, who are poor, who are rich, sannyasis, kriyastas, brahmanas, kshatriyas, everybody. So let's talk briefly about what we can learn from uh, these great kings whom we have talked about just now. What lessons? Yes. Lesson, main lesson we can learn is material estimation cannot uh, estimate the spiritual ecstasy of King Kurushekar. As we can see, that the minister, they, even though Lord Ram himself came and uh, protected, uh, brought uh, King Kurushekar to his back to his kingdom and they had a celebration, but ministers, one after another, they could not understand, they were in material estimation how the spiritual ecstasy of King Kulushekar was. So, mm. we can really see... You know. So, material intelligence 
cannot estimate or understand spiritual excellence or spiritual glories. With a material consciousness or a material analysis, we will not be able to understand the glories of devotional service or the glories of devotees. Therefore, devotees have traditionally and historically, great devotees have always been criticized by the society around them. They've always been persecuted, isn't it? You look at any great devotee, always there has been criticism and persecution because they cannot understand their consciousness. Very nice. What other lessons have we learned from these stories? Yes. From King Prabhupada Pastor, we can understand the eagerness to associate with devotees. Yes, from King Kulashekhar, we learn about the eagerness to associate with devotees. Very nice. And in that eagerness to associate, did he make any distinction that I am such a big king and you are just an ordinary person? No. Because you see, in front of the Lord, there is no position of high and low. So the king did not distinguish. Even though they may have been very poor people, very normal, ordinary, so-called ordinary people in the world, if they were devotees, then King Kulu Shekhar respected them and served them, no matter what they may have been in material estimation. So King Kulu Shekhar's eagerness to serve the devotees, hmm? even as a king, he didn't have the ego, I'm such a big king, such a big person in the world, therefore how can I uh, bend down and serve such ordinary people? Very nice point. What else? Yes. From, from King Pratabhutra, he has a complete faith and strong determination to serve uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes. From King Pratabhutra, we can learn of the complete determination and faith to serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we must be determined strongly. Yes. Think yourself to be lower than the other devotees. Okay, very nice. Like who in this story? What I spoke just now? Prataparudra. Hmm, yes. The mic is not working. He was he was sweeping the floor even though he was a great king. Yes, excellent. So because he was a great king, he didn't think, oh, this is such a lowly service. How can I do this? No, he was prepared to do it. He had no considerations of high and low. So in the service of Krishna, we should not make a distinction. Oh, that is very low-class service for me. I'll do only the high-class service. I'll only give the lectures. Then I'll only lead the kirtans and I'll only do some leading service. But cleaning the toilets? No, no, no. That I cannot do. No. When it's for Krishna, everything is the same. Krishna is pleased with the attitude of service more than the actual service itself. So King Prataprudra demonstrated this. Yes, what else? The mic, you can give the mic. We should follow in the footsteps. Yes, it's on. We should follow in the footsteps of uh, King Kula Shekhar and have absorption in hearing, the way he was absorbed in hearing the pastimes of Lord Ram. Yes, we should in the fo follow in the footsteps of King Kula Shekhar and try to be absorbed in the pastimes of the Lord, in hearing and reciting. Although, as I said, we shouldn't imitate, right? But we should learn about how in important it is for us to be absorbed. What a question. If the king say today, but who has the time to do all this? I have to govern the country. How would you reply? 
you know what chanakya says in his artha shastra if you look at how he describes the duties of a king i actually calculated many years ago i don't remember the details now when i went through those sections and i calculated the time that he says the every day that he talks about the king's daily time table what it should be like how much time he should give for this how much time for that and i calculated the different times that are meant for some religious or spiritual purposes and it comes to almost 5 to 6 hours that means the king every day is supposed to spend 5 to 6 hours for any religious or spiritual purpose and then so many hours for meeting with the spies and so many, you know he talks of many other things and very little time for sleeping so if you think being a king is something very nice very easy it's not an easy job being a king so there the time was there so even chanakya said for kings leaders they must find time for hearing about the lord then they can rule the kingdom with a proper frame of mind otherwise they will simply mismanage the kingdom yes very nice what else yes situation is not an obstacle for devotion service so we can we have seen that sanyasis who have uh, renounced they are able to serve and equally kings who are very powerful they can serve so material condition is not an obstacle for very nice point material conditions are not an obstacle for performing devotional service in terms of one's ashram one's varna sanyasis can do it householders can do it kings can do it brahmanas can do it melbourneers can do it anybody can do it and should do it any other lessons yes when uh, lord ram was in trouble like when brahmanas are coming to say that why not to the guru sekra and when he saw the lord ram is in trouble so he immediately went to help him so he was so much absorbed in his devotional service so i am thinking that or it should be and not have so much knowledge that he forget at his lord he, he was maybe uh, doing his one of the past times of his rasa maybe as a parent friend or lover so he he was so much absorbed that he forgot that he is the lord and he immediately went to help him sorry if i'm wrong no, no that's right he was absorbed in that rasa he was trying to serve the lord he was in an ecstatic <coughs> trance yeah this was not normal consciousness he was absorbed now our point is what are the lessons now the discussion going on is what are the lessons we can learn from all these stories bearing in mind that we can't imitate yes okay yeah uh, we saw that uh, when king had full faith in true vaishnavas and he had so much faith that even he can he escaped the death so we learned that we should have full faith in the vaishnavas and there are our two friends in this uh, material world Yes, so one must have faith in devotees as well. In this, the pure Vaishnavas, one must have faith, and that will bring in all auspiciousness in our life. Any other lessons? Yes, Mike. Then. From Mukunda Mala Stotra, we can learn. perform devotional service when, when we, we are, are fit and young hmm. and not let with time it doesn't happen so from king kula shekhar we can understand the devotional service should be begun very young we need not wait till the point of death and then start trying to think of krishna we should start practicing as early as possible so that there are better chances that we may be fully successful correct what are the lessons yes mike here please we we learned from both stories actually prataputra and kula shekar the how precarious it is to offend the lord or the pure devotees of the lord like in prataputra's sto- um, story would would be the sweeping incident 
um, whereby judging and offending a pure devotee of the Lord has precarious consequences. And in Kula Shekhar's story, he was merciful to his sus, to his uh, yeah. But they did uh, of offend him by by having that test of accusing the Vaishnavas, you know, which is offending him and offending the pure Vaishnavas. So Vaishnava Aprat, yeah. So we have to be cautious not to offend. Yes, and anyway, as a result of that, what happened? The ministers lost the king. The king left the kingdom and went. He was actually a very good king. So there are precarious consequences for offending devotees and for offending the Lord. Hmm? That's a very important lesson. Yes, another lesson can you give to mine? Take the blessings of the God before you uh, start a journey for fighting for Him. <laughs> Take the blessings of the Lord before you go out to fight. <laughs> yes. Actually, take the blessings of the Lord before doing anything. Anything. That is very important. Hmm? Whether it is uh, your daily work, actually it is a custom in many places even till today that in certain places many people don't start their day's work or a business until they've visited the temple, had darshan. Then they go to their place of work. And many devotees, they don't go to work till they've ch chanted certain number of rounds and so on. Okay, any other lessons? Yes. Krishna has his own ways of helping. Uh, we cannot dictate our terms like Krishna will help this way or that way. In terms of King, Kulish, uh, King Prataparudra, he thought that Krishna didn't help him and he lost. But Krishna had his own ways of helping. Yes, in the devotional service of the Lord, we should never become disheartened. We should not think that, oh, I've been doing devotional service for so many years and no result, and I'm not getting the mercy. But it is coming, there is mercy, it will come. But Krishna will give that mercy at His own time, in His own way, that we may not understand how. Just like Pratap Rudra got so much mercy from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, more than what anybody had received. Not only did he get the chance to personally serve Mahaprabhu's lotus feet. He got to sing before Mahaprabhu, something which only uh, his select intimate associates were allowed to do and that also in the night. And Mahaprabhu embraced him personally and then also revealed all his opulences to him. So such mercy King Pratap Rudra got. And why was that so? for two reasons. Number one, his own sincere, dedicated, determined faith and devotional service. And second, he had won the hearts of the devotees. So the devotees petitioned Mahaprabhu. And that's how Mahaprabhu's heart softened. So if you have trouble dealing with Krishna, then tell the devotees to deal on your behalf with Krishna. The devotees say, Krishna, please <laughs> look after this devotee. Please help this devotee then Krishna will listen. Any other points? Any lessons? Yes. Uh, Say that again, whatever you were saying. So the, the Lord takes charge of the devotees' uh, life who are surrendered. So in the case of Kurushottam Dev, uh, Lord Jagannath and Baladev, they actually went ahead and uh, fought with the uh, uh, king of Kanchi. Yes. So when you become a staunch devotee of the Lord and surrender to Him, then He takes care of your life. He takes charge of your life. Hmm? So you are fully secure. But the moment we act independently, then Krishna says, okay, then I'll, I'll back off. 
But if we surrender, then Krishna will say, all right, you want to surrender? I'll take charge, I'll take care of you. Very important lesson. Any other lessons? Yes. You see in the life of King Prataparudra, uh, the first thing is he took a humble position uh, to please the Lord. And also his mood was not only humble, in a prayerful mood, which pleased the Lord. So we had to approach the Lord in a humble state and then in a yes. prayerful mood. Right. We have to approach the Lord in a very prayerful and humble mood. We cannot go to the Lord uh, in the mood that I am a king. Right? Just see, I am a great king, my Lord, I have come in front of you. No, we go as a humble servant of the Lord. Therefore, in the nectar of devotion it is explained that there are some things which are called aparads, seva aparad, hmm? offenses against the temple, against the deity. And one of them is to come into the temple on a palanquin. <laughs> of course, nowadays you don't have palanquins. But in the old days, the kings, the queens, they would travel on palanquins. People would carry them on the shoulder, they would be sitting comfortably. So, you are forbidden to come inside the temple on a palanquin because you, you can't come in like a king or a queen. You have to walk in on your own. You can't come in with a kingly mentality. Therefore, after reading that, I remember, I don't get off from a car when the car stops in front of the gate of the temple. And there are some, many temples where right in front of the main gate you can look straight and see the deity. Because there are many different gates and it goes straight to the deity. So this is our modern day Palki, huh? <laughs> Palanquin. So, if, you know, if the darshan of the deity is there from the main gate and you are over here and you get off like a king, from the, somebody's driving, you come out of the car and walk in. Hmm? So I always tell them, park behind. Don't park near the entrance, right in front of the gate. So then you walk from there and then go up. Hmm? So when you go, we don't go with any uh, proud mentality. We go in a very humble frame of mind before the Lord. Very nice. What else? Yes. Things are in the daily life, they are very much busy. They are always uh, remembering Krishna. So we need to learn this that we always remember Krishna even though in your daily life. Yes, yeah, so even though we may be very busy in our day-to-day -day life, we shouldn't think that's not an excuse for us to not remember Krishna. So great kings were doing it, so we should also be doing the same. Okay, one last lesson. Yes. Uh, from King Pratap Rudra, we can learn uh, Guru Nishta as well as the sense of renunciation. Guru Nishta, because he used to go to Kashi Mishra's house every day to massage his feet. And uh, sense of renunciation, because he decided to renounce the entire kingdom just to see the Lord. Very nice. So from King Pratap Rudra, we hear, learn Guru Nishta as well as a sense of detachment uh, from the kingdom. He was, he was willing to give it up simply because he didn't get the audience of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And finally, before we conclude, I want to speak about our great modern-day hero. Who is that? Srila Prabhupada. And it goes to show that the heroes we are talking about don't fit into the normal stereotypes of, of heroes that we imagine in our mind. Hmm? Srila Prabhupada was not your normal run-of-the-mill hero. He was not young and uh, like a, you know, some uh, superhero in a movie or something. He was 70 years old when he left for America. No money and in frail health. 
and look at the challenges that he he had to experience on the way two heart attacks constant sea sickness and when he reached america no knowing where he would live what he would do what he would eat so much risk simply on the uh, on the order of his guru that was given to him 45 years ago that you should go to the western countries and preach so just on that he had faith in that one order and he meditated on that order for so many years and he prepared for it and then he went abroad and took so many hardships first of all in preparing for this there were so many hardships he had to live in in vrindavan in a very simple situation he had become a vanaprastha after vanaprastha he took sanyas he lived in which place in vrindavan the radha damodar temple but do you know the name of the temple he lived in briefly before he moved to radha damodar temple chippiwara temple huh? chippiwara temple in delhi that is in delhi but in vrindavan vansi gopal temple near keshi ghat and this time in vrindavan when we went on parikrama for the 40th anniversary of krishna balram mandir all the devotees went to that temple also vansi gopal temple very old temple and stone temple and prabhupad lived on the second floor the top floor and some of the devotees they were commenting they're talking just see this floor is way on the top and you know vrindavan gets so hot in the summer the temperatures can go up to 45 degrees centigrade and if you're living on the top floor where the stone it just becomes hot like fire so prabhupad lived there and in the winters it becomes very cold the temperatures can go down to 1 degree centigrade remember without any heating facility so prabhupad lived there he prepared uh, led a very simple life and then he moved to radha damodar temple and he was translating books he was writing the back to godhead magazine going to delhi getting it printed he was doing the proof reading writing distributing financing collecting donations everything and in those days the transportation to delhi was not so easy from vrindavan nowadays you have the express way and you can reach within 2 2 and a half hours to delhi and then he would take hours to reach delhi one time he was knocked down by a cow and he suffered injuries he had fallen down on the road so much austerity he had to take even before he left and then he had to find a way to go to america he didn't have any money so he wanted a free ticket so he had to go to sumati morarji from sindhya steam navigation company in bombay and she was trying to discourage him first of all he hardly was able to get an appointment because the secretary would not allow him to meet her but he just sat on the stairs and waited all day till till she came out in the evening just sitting on the stairs of the building hmm? imagine can you imagine like just whole day just sitting and chanting just like ordinary person on the street sitting on the stairs there then when she came out so oh, swami ji you are here what do you, what do you want then he said i want to meet you then she called him for appointment and she tried to discourage him swami ji you are an old man you will not be able to take this journey on the ship and this is a cargo ship not even a passenger ship and where will you stay there what will you do you are in frail health the prabhupad was determined he said no i will go so then she gave him a free ticket and then he took the journey suffered his health suffered like anything and in america once he landed he was in a completely different zone the people were strange the language was strange their habits were strange 
and he had to settle in New York for the cheapest possible accommodation which was in the dirtiest possible place where all kinds of hippies came who were drug addicts, alcoholics, sometimes violent people came there and he had to live in the midst of all these people. All sorts of experiences he had. Many times crazy people would come in and do all sorts of things. And in the hippies of those days, in the drug generation, they had a slogan because they were rebelling against their elders. So their slogan was, never trust anybody above 30 years of age. But they were all young people, face 17, 18, 20, 25. So they felt anybody above 30 is not to be trusted. And here was somebody, not 30, but 70. And not only did they begin to trust him, they surrendered their life to him. He cooked for them, he cleaned for them, he taught them, and he had to endure so many austerities because they didn't know anything. They didn't know basic culture, they didn't know cleanliness, they didn't know etiquette. And they would do all sorts of things. He had to tolerate so much. One time when one devotee, Malati Mataji, she found a small, some small deities of Jagannath in some antique store. And she thought it was some nice ancient Indian doll or something. So she brought it to Prabhupada. Prabhu, where did you find this? She said, in such and such shop. Did you find another something like this? And he described. Then she went back and got the whole set, Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra. Then Prabhupada said, yes, let us make big deities. So he had one devotee car because her friend, Sham Sundar Prabhu. So he knew a little bit of carving, wood carving. But they were still not devotees proper. So he was carving the deity of Jagannath and Prabhupada went time, one time went to inspect the deity and he found a cigarette packet on top of Jagannath <laughs> as the carving was going on. There was, they didn't know anything. They were just trying to help Prabhupada. The young men, women off the street coming in and Prabhupada engaged them in seva. Then gradually, what to speak of giving up smoking and other things, they even gave up uh, their very professions, their, uh, their way of living. They completely surrendered to Krishna and became pure-hearted devotees. But in the beginning years, Prabhupada had to go through so many things. And as the movement grew, everywhere, not only was there ecstatic news of the preaching growing, but there were also so many challenges. Everywhere people started getting worried, these Hare Krishnas are growing too fast, what are they? In India, they were called CIA agents. And some movies were made which showed them in very bad light. In different countries also, they, they thought the Hare Krishnas are basically out to destroy the country. They thought they will pull down the government. So in every country, the police would arrest them. So many problems they had to undergo and Prabhupada had to hear all this news and try to see what to do about it. And one time, Prabhupada said, actually the yogis sitting in the Himalayas, they don't have any headaches. But I have so many headaches. <laughs> hmm? Because I have to see this worldwide mission. Hmm? So Prabhupada took unlimited headache, traveled the world 14 times at that advanced age, continued writing through the night, translating, preaching, managing, doing everything. He was expert in everything. He was an all-rounder. He would talk to the scientists, he would talk to the philosophers, he would talk to political leaders. He would talk to the ordinary persons from the street. In this way, what a miracle that he, he, fa, fa, he, he created hmm? in 12 years. Thousands of disciples, millions of books distributed, many, many books written and published. 
108 centers all over the world, miracle. Only a great hero can do that. Only one who is truly empowered by Krishna. Krishna Shakti Vininahitar Pravartana. So, Kaviraj Goswami says that unless one is truly empowered by Krishna, one cannot do such extraordinary preaching activities. It's not possible. One man, one old man, just see how much difference it made. And today we are here because he went there. Had Srila Prabhupada not gone to America, today we would not be sitting here. Or even if he did come to Ballarat, he would come for other purposes like the other people that come here. Not for this reason. So Srila Prabhupada is our real hero. He is our modern day hero. And we have to express our heartfelt gratitude to him. History will recognize his his contributions. History has not sufficiently recognized it yet because we are too close in time to him. As the generations go by and this movement grows and grows and grows and one day it will become mainstream. Today we are considered a fringe, small section. Some people consider a cult. But this is not a cult. This is not fringe. It's mainstream actually. But people don't realize it. One day it will become or a major force in the world. So we have to participate in this. If we assist that great transcendental hero, then in Krishna's eyes we will also become heroes. One time Prabhupada gave a... Uh, you want, somebody asked for service. He said, you want some service? then you can share my headache. <laughs> so we can also share Prabhupada's headache in spreading this mission everywhere. Srila mm -hmm. Prabhupada Ki Jai. So I would like to thank the devotees who have organized this program, who worked very, very hard arranging everything for us I don't want to name them lest I miss out any one devotee even. But the organizing team who has put this whole retreat together, I want to offer my heartfelt thanks to them. They have worked very, very hard preparing uh, for this retreat, making all the arrangements for us, uh, publicity, the, the venue and so many other things. So I really want to thank them very much. And of course I want to thank all of you for having come here. When on an Easter long weekend you could have been doing other things as well. And thank you for participating so enthusiastically in this two-day retreat. And I hope and pray that by Srila Prabhupada's mercy we will all be able to progress very nicely in Krishna consciousness and help spread this movement everywhere. So I'll quickly try to answer questions, but these questions are very long. <laughs> How do we take the instruction of spiritual master which is not asked for and got without any request? Accept it <laughs> with a grateful heart. Then, second point, how do we take the instruction of the spiritual master which is very hard to follow? <laughs> Considering the constraints of age, health, mindset, etc. If there are genuine issues, problems, you can always reveal them and say, I have such and such issue, I, I'm sorry, it is very hard for me to do this particular seva. So definitely that will be understood. How do we take the instruction of the spiritual master which, is, which requires cooperation and support from the spouse? And I see there is no hope for that. <laughs> no. 
And that's why there is no name here. <laughs> Cooperation will come, don't worry. It will happen. With prasadam and with chanting, everything will happen. Could you please explain the reasons for the change towards worship of Radha Krishna from Madhavendra Puri onwards? That change implied deviating from the instructions of the Sampradaya of his Guru Sri Lakshmi Pati. Madhavendra Puri was already spontaneously an ecstatic devotee of Krishna. Lakshmi Pati was not against worship of Vrindavan. It's not that the devotees in the Madhva Sampradaya don't recognize Vrindavan or Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. It is just that spontaneously and naturally Madhavendra Puri's mood was like that because he is an eternal associate of Krishna from Goloka Vrindavan. When Krishna descends into this world, his associates from Goloka Vrindavan also descend. Some before him, some along with him and some shortly after him. So Madhavendra Puri was one of these eternal associates coming in from Goloka Vrindavan. Can we please sing Gopi Geet? <laughs> Not the time to do that. In Kartik in Vrindavan. How can one desire, remove the desire for name and fame? And what is the practical way of dealing with it if it comes? Well, by hearing about it, by hearing about these topics, strengthening our intelligence and chanting so that our heart is purified, all these anarthas can be removed. How can we remove the, an offensive mentality that has entered the mind? By chanting and serving the Vaishnavas. In Bhagavad Gita 4.34, we certainly believe in learning truth by submissively approaching a spiritual master and accepting all their orders. But in the age of Kali, There are examples of people losing their consciousness. Can we, how can we strengthen and build our consciousness to avoid any influence? Well, therefore we have an institution like ISKCON, which is, which is full of so many wonderful devotees. And it is such a nice protection, such an umbrella under which whatever happens, we are we are secure and sheltered. Can you please tell me how to choose a guru? <laughs> Ask Krishna. Pray to Krishna for inspiration. The harder you pray to Krishna for inspiration, Krishna will give you inspiration in the heart. And you must also have certain basic knowledge of the scripture so that you can understand what is what. But ultimately, that is something that will come by internal inspiration. How to really digest and imbibe the qualities of these great leaders we have heard about on the long term? We imbibe by hearing and then trying to follow in our life. So hearing and remembering is very important. Do we wait to become pure to have those good qualities or, to de or, or develop the qualities first and then try to become pure? No, it is a simultaneous process. The more we, we follow the process of devotional service, the qualities develop automatically. And we should also try to uh, attempt to bring in the good qualities that will help us to practice our Krishna consciousness nicely. How is it that Ramachandra Puri was a disciple of a pure devotee Madhavendra Puri who was a personalist when Ramachandra Puri was, was and latently an impersonalist in a bona fide disciplic succession? Actually, the Puri lineage was not a Vaishnava lineage. 
because in those days there wasn't much of a Vaishnava mother and, and initiation. <coughs> there were some Puris who were, of course, Vaishnava and some who may not have been also. In Varanasi there were so many who were not Vaishnavas. But somehow or the other, Ramachandra Puri was like that. He was latently already and already an impersonalist. Okay, the question is about Arjuna. The succession uh, was revived by Krishna, but our parampara comes from Brahma. So how do we understand this? There are two different types of paramparas. One is the parampara of Raja Rishis, the saintly kings. And the other is the parampara of saintly devotees. So we are following in the parampara of the devotees, not of the Raja Rishis. The Raja Rishi parampara sometimes is broken and has to be revived. But the parampara of the saintly devotees is always maintained somehow or the other. One of the glories to chanting is eradication of material contaminations. And why do we have aparad? That comes about because we are doing something incorrectly. The fault is not with devotional service. The fault is with our in, incorrect way of doing devotional service. Krishna in the Gita says that there will be no one more dear to me than one who practices, preaches my message. Then what about those devotees who may be engaged in seva like making flower garlands for the deities and are not directly engaged in preaching? Are they considered as equally dear to Krishna? I dealt with this yesterday, you remember? Yes, they are also heroes. Because everything in our movement is preaching actually. I think we should stop, no? It's like an Akshay Patra. <laughs> Yes, I think it's getting late. We'll stop here. All services in our mission are actually preaching oriented. Because if we have nice decoration of the deities, nice worship, nice outfits, nice garlands, it's very attractive. It brings people to Krishna. Cooking, if your prasadam is very nice, offered with devotion, cooked with devotion, served with devotion, then people also become very uh, attracted by that. So everything we do in our temples, in our movement, is preaching. Okay, so we'll stop here now. Thank you very much. So now the next part of the program. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.